Chapter 13. Hypothesis. Approximately two out of three fake dating situations will eventually involve room sharing. 50% of room sharing situations will be further complicated by the presence of only one bad. There was an Airbnb 25 minutes from the conference center, but it was an inflatable mattress on the floor of a storage room, charging 180 bucks per night, and even if she could have afforded it, one of the reviews reported that the host had a penchant for playing Viking with the guests, so no thank you. She found a more affordable one forty-five minutes away by subway, but when she went to reserve the room, she discovered that someone had beaten and hurt it by mere seconds, and she was tempted to hurl her laptop across the coffee shop. She was trying to decide between a seedy motel and a cheap couch in the suburbs when a shadow cast over her. She looked up from with a frown, expecting an undergrad wanting to use the outlet she'd been holding, and instead found, oh. Adam was standing in front of her, the late afternoon sunlight ha- haloing his hair and shoulders, fingers closed around an iPad, as he looked down at her with a somber expression. It had been less than a week since she'd last seen him, six days to be precise, which was just a handful of hours and minutes. Nothing, considering that she'd barely known him a month. And yet, it was as if the space she was in, the whole campus, the entire city, was transformed by knowing that he was back. Possibilities. That's what Adam's present presence felt like. Of what? She was not certain. Or her mouth was dry an event of great scientific interest, considering that she'd taken a sip from her water bottle maybe ten seconds ago. You're back. I am. She hadn't forgotten his voice, or his height, or the way his stupid clothes fit him. She couldn't have. She had two medial temporal lobes fully functioning and tucked nicely inside her skull which meant that she was perfectly able to encode and store memories. She hadn't forgotten anything, as she wasn't sure why right now it felt as if she had. I thought I didn't. Yes, Olive, wonderful, very eloquent. I didn't know that you were back. His face was a little closed off, but he nodded. I flew in last night. Oh, she should have probably prepared something to say, but she hadn't expected him to see him until Wednesday. If she had, maybe she wouldn't have been wearing her oldest leggings and most tattered t-shirt, and her hair wouldn't have been a mess. Not that she was under any illusion that Adam would have noticed her if she'd been wearing a swimsuit or a gala dress. But still, do do you want to sit down? She leaned forward to gather her phone and notebook, making room on the other side of the small table. It was only when she he hesitated before taking a seat that it occurred to her that maybe he had no intention of staying, that now he might feel forced to do so. He folded himself into the chair gracefully, like a big cat. Great job, Olive. Who doesn't love a needy person who hounds them for attention? You don't have to. I know you're busy. MacArthur grants to win and grads to brutalize and broccoli to eat. He'd probably rather be anywhere else. She bit her thumbnail, feeling guilty, staring, starting to panic, and and then he smiled. And suddenly there was, there were grooves around his mouth and dimples in his cheeks, and his face was completely altered by them. The air at the table thinned. Olive couldn't quite breathe. You know, there's middle ground between living off brownies and exclusively eating broccoli. She grinned, for no reason other than Adam was here, with her. 
and he was smiling. That's a lie. He shook his head, mouth still curved. How are you? Better now, she thought. Good. How was Boston? Good. I'm glad you're back. I'm pretty sure the biology dropout rates have been have seen a steep reduction. We can't have that. He gave her a patient put upon look. You look tired, smart ass. Oh, yeah, I she rubbed her cheek with her hand, ordering herself not to feel self conscious about her looks, just like she'd always made the point not to. It would be an equally stupid idea to wonder what the woman holding mansion the other day looked like. Probably stunning, probably feminine, with curves, someone who actually needed to wear a bra, someone who was not half-covered and freckles, who had mastered the art of applying liquid eyeliner without making a mess of herself. I'm fine. It's been a week, though. She massaged her temple. He cocked his head. What happened? Nothing. My friends are stupid and I hate them. She felt instantly guilty and made a face. Actually, I don't hate them. I do hate that I love them, though. Is this the sunscreen friend? On. The one and only. And my roommates, too, who really should know better. What did they do? They... Olive pressed into both eyes with her fingers. It's a long story. They found alternative accommodations for CBD, which means that now I have to find a place on my own. Why did they do that? Because she briefly closed her eyes and sighed. Because they assumed that I'd want to stay with you, since you're my, you know, boyfriend. He went still for a couple of seconds and then... I see. Yeah, a pretty bold assumption, but she spread her arms and shrugged. He bit the inside of his cheek, looking pensive. I'm sorry you won't get to room with them. She waved a hand. Oh, that's not it. That would have been fun, but it's just that now I need to find something else nearby and there are no affordable options. Her eyes fell on the screen of her laptop. I'm thinking of booking this motel that's an hour away, and won't they know? She looked up from the gra- grainy, shady-looking picture of the place. Hmm? Won't Ah know that you're not staying with me? Oh. Where are you staying? The conference hotel. Of course. Well, she scratched her nose. I wouldn't tell her. I don't think she'll pay too much attention. But she'll notice if you're staying one hour away. I... Yeah. They would notice and ask questions and Olive would have to come up with a bunch of excuses and have more half-truths to deal with. Add a few blocks to this Yenga Tower of Lies she'd been building for weeks. I'll figure it out. He nodded slowly. I'm sorry. No, it's not your fault. One could argue that it is, in fact, my fault. Not at all. I would offer to pay for your hotel room, but I doubt there's anything left in the 10-mile radius. Oh, no. She shook her head emphatically. And I wouldn't accept it. It's not a cup of coffee and a scone and a cookie and a pumpkin frappuccino. She batted her eyes with him at him and leaned forward trying to change the topic which by the way is new on the menu you could totally buy it for me and that would make my day sure he looked slightly nauseous awesome she grinned i think it's cheaper today some kind of tuesday sale so but you could room with me the way he put it forward calm and sensible almost made it sound like it was no big deal and olive almost fell for it until her ears and brain seemed to finally connect with each other and she was able to process the meaning of what he just said. That she could room with him. Olive knew full well what sharing quarters with someone entailed. Even for a very short period, sleeping in the same room, 
men seeing embarrassing pajamas, taking turns to use the bathroom, hearing the swish of someone trying to find a comfortable position under the sheets, loud and clear in the dark. Sleeping in the same room meant... No, no, it was a terrible idea, and Olive was starting to think that maybe she had maxed those out for a while, so she cleared her throat. I could not, actually. He nodded calmly, but then, then he asked equally calmly, Why? As she wanted to bang her head against the table. I couldn't. The room is a double, of course, he offered, as if that piece of information could have possibly changed her mind. It's not a good idea. Why? Because people will think that we... She noticed Adam's looks and immediately hushed. Okay, fine. They already think that, but... But? Adam, she rubbed her forehead with her fingers. There will be only one bad. He frowned. No, as I said, it's a double. It's not. It won't be. There will be only one bad for sure. He gave her a puzzled look. I cut I got the booking confirmation the other day. I can forward it to you if you want. It says that it doesn't matter what it says. It's always one bad. He stared at her perplexed as she sighed and leaned helplessly against the back of her chair. He'd clearly never seen a rom-com or read a romance novel in his life. Nothing. Ignore me. My symposium is part of a satellite workshop the day before the conference starts, and then I'll be speaking on the first day the actual conference. I have to room for the entire conference, but I'll probably need to leave for some meetings after night too. So you'd be by yourself from night there. From night three. With only overlap for... One night, she listened to the logical, methodical way she, he listed sensible reasons why she should just accept his offer and felt a wave of panic sweep over her. It seems like a bad idea. That's fine, I just don't understand why. Because. Because I don't want to. Because I have it bad. Because it, it'll probably have it even worse after that, because it's going to be the week of September 29th, and I've been trying hard not to think about it. Are you afraid that I'll try to kiss you without your consent, to sit on your lap or fondle you under the pretext of applying sunscreen? Because I would never. Olive chucked her phone at him. He caught it in his left hand, studied its glitter amino acid case with a pleased expression, and then carefully set it next to her laptop. I hate you, she told him, sullen. She might have been pouting and smiling at the same time. His mouth twitched. I know. Am I ever going to live that stuff down? Unlikely. And if you do, I'm sure something else will come up. She huffed, crossing her arms over her chest, and they exchanged... A small smile. I can ask Holden or Tom if I can stay with them and leave you my room, he suggested. But they know that I already have one, so I'd have to come up with excuses. No, I'm not going to kick you out of your room, she ran a hand through her hair and exhaled. You'd hate it, he tilted his head. What? Rooming with me? I would? Yeah. You seem like a person who... You seem like you like to keep others at arm's length, uncompromising and ever so hard to know. You seem like you care very little about what people think of you. You seem like you know what you're doing. You seem equally horrible and awesome and just the thought that there's someone you'd like to open up to, someone who's not me, makes me feel like I can't sit at this table at any longer. But she didn't say that. Like you'd, you'd want your own space. He held her gaze. Olive, I think I'll be fine. But it's if you end up not being fine, then you'd be stuck with me. It's one night. His jaw clenched and relaxed. And he added, we are friends, no? Her own words thrown back at her. I don't want 
to be your friend, she was tempted to say. Thing was, she also didn't want to not be his friend. What she wanted was completely outside of her ability to obtain, and she needed to forget it, scrap it from her brain. Yes, we are. Then, as a friend, don't force me to worry about you using public transportation transportation late at night in a city you're not familiar with. Biking on roads without bike lanes is bad enough, he muttered, and she immediately felt a weight sink into her stomach. He was trying to be a good friend. He cared for her. And instead of being satisfied with what she currently had, she had to ruin it all and and want more. She took a deep breath. Are you sure that it wouldn't bother you? He nodded, silent. Okay then. Okay, she forced herself to smile. Do you snore? He huffed out a laugh. Oh, I don't. Oh, come on. How can you not know? He shrugged. I just don't. Well, that probably means you don't. Otherwise, someone would have to, would have told you. Someone? A roommate? It occurred to her that Adam was 34 and likely hadn't had a roommate in about a decade. Or a girlfriend. He smiled faintly and lowered his gaze. I guess my girlfriend will tell me of her CBD then. He said it in a quiet, unassuming tone, clearly trying to make a joke, but Olive's cheeks warmed, and she couldn't quite bear the look to look at him anymore. Instead, she picked at a thread on, her, on the sleeve of her cardigan and searched for something to say. My stupid abstract, she cleared her throat. It was ex- accepted as a talk. He met her eyes. Faculty panel. Yeah. You're not happy? No, she winced. Is it the public speaking thing? He'd remembered. Of course he had. Yeah, it will be awful. Adam stared at her and said nothing. Not that it would be fine. Not that the talk would go smoothly. Not that she was overreacting and underselling a fantastic opportunity. His calm acceptance of her anxiety had the exact opposite effect of Dr. Aslan's enthusiasm. It relaxed her. When I was in my third year of grad school, he said quietly, my advisor sent me to give a faculty symposium in his stead. He told me only two days before, without any slides or a script, just the title of the talk. Wow. Olive tried to imagine what that would have felt like being expected to perform something so daunting with so little forewarning. At the same time, part of her marveled at Adam's self-disclosing dis- something without being asked a direct question. Why did he do that? Who knows? He tilted his head back, staring at a spot about above her head. His tone held a trace of bitterness. Because he had an emergency, because he thought it'd be a formative experience, because he could. Olive just bad that he could. She didn't know. Adam's former advisor, but academia was very much an old boys club, where those who had the power liked to take advantage of those who didn't without repercussions. Was it a formative experience? He shrugged again. As much as anything that keeps you awake in a panic for 48 hours straight can be. Olive smiled. And you did you do? And how did you do? I did. He pressed his lips together. Not well enough. He was silent for a long moment. His gaze... He was... His gaze locked somewhere outside the cafe's window. Then again, nothing was ever good enough. It seemed impossible that someone might look at Adam's scientific accomplishments and find them lacking, that he could ever be anything less than the best at what he did. 
he was, why he was so severe in his judgment of others. Because he'd been taught to set the same impossible standards for himself. Do you still keep in touch with him? Your advisor, I mean. He's retired now. Tom has taken over what used to be his lab. It was such an uncharacteristically opaque, carefully worded answer. Olive couldn't help being curious. Did you like him? It's complicated. He rubbed a hand over his jaw, looking pensive and far away. No, no, I didn't like him. I still don't. He was... It took him so long to continue. She almost convinced herself that he wouldn't. But he did, staring at the late afternoon sunlight disappearing behind the oak trees. Brutal. My advisor was brutal. She chuckled, and Adam's eyes darted back to her face, narrow with confusion. Sorry. She was still laughing a little. It's just funny to hear your complain about your old mentor, because... Because? Because he sounds exactly like you. I'm not like him, he retorted more sharply than Olive had come to expect from him. It made her snort. Adam, I'm pretty sure that if we were to ask anyone to describe you with one word, brutal would come up one or ten times. She saw him stiffen before she was even done speaking, the line of his shoulders suddenly tense and rigid, his jaw tight and with a slight twitch to it. Her first instinct was to apologize, but she was not sure what for what? There was nothing new to what she just told him. They discussed his blunt, uncompromising, mentoring style before, and he'd always taken it in stride, owned it even. And yet his fists were clenched on the table and his eyes were darker than usual. I, Adam, did I? She stammered, but he interrupted her before she could continue. Everyone has issues with their advisors he said, and there was a finality to his tone that warned her not to finish her sentence, not to ask what happened, where did you just go? So she swallowed and nodded. Dr. Aslan is, she hesitated. His knuckles were not quite as white anymore, and the tension in his muscles was slowly dissolving. It was possible that she'd imagined it. Yes, she must have. She's great. But sometimes I feel like she doesn't really understand that I need more guidance, support, some practical advice instead of blind encouragement. But she didn't say that. I'm not even sure what I need myself. I think that might be part of the problem. I'm not very good at communicating it. He nodded and appeared to choose his words carefully. It's hard mentoring. No one teaches you how to do it. We're trained to become scientists, but as professors we're also in charge of making sure that students learn to produce rigorous science. I hold my grads accountable and I set high standards for them. They're scared of me and that's fine. The stakes are high and if being scared means that they're taking their training seriously, then I'm okay with it. She tilted her head. What do you mean? My job is to make sure that my old old graduate students don't become mediocre scientists. That means I'm the one who's tasked with demanding what they rerun their experience or adjust their hypotheses. It comes with the territory. Olive had never been a people pleaser. But Adam's attitude toward others' perception of him was so cavalier, it was almost fascinating. You, do you really not care, she asked, curious, that your grads might dislike you as a person? No, I don't like them very much either. She thought of Jess and Alex and the other half dozen grads and postdocs mentored by Adam, whom she didn't know very well. The thought of him finding them as annoying as they found him despotic made her chuckle. To be fair, I don't like people in general. Right, 
Don't ask, Olive. Do not ask. Do you like me? A millisecond of hesitation as he pressed his lips together. No, you're a smart ass with abysmal taste in beverages. He traced the corner of his iPad, a small smile playing on his lips. Send me your slides. My slides? For your talk, I take a look at them. Olive tried not to gape at him. Oh, you... I'm not your grad. You don't have to. I know. You really don't have to. I want to, he said, was pitched low. And even as he looked into her eyes, and Olive had to avert her gaze because something felt too tight in her chest. Okay, she finally managed to snap out the loose tread on her sleeve. How likely is it that your feedback will cause me to cry under the shower? That depends on the quality of your slides, she smiled. Don't feel like you have to hold back. Believe me, I don't. Good. Great. She sighed, but it was reassuring, knowing that he was going to be checking her work. Will you come to my talk? She heard herself ask, and was as surprised by the request as Adam seemed to be. I... Do you want me to? No. No, it's not going to be horrible and humiliating and probably a disaster and... You're going to see me at my worst and weakest. It's probably best if you lock yourself into the bathroom for the entire duration of the panel, just so you don't accidentally wander in and see me making a fool of myself. But she didn't say that. And yet, just the idea of having him there, sitting in the audience, sitting in the audience, made the prospect seem like less of an ordeal. He was not her advisor, and he wasn't going to be able to do much if she got inundated by a barrage of impossible questions, or if the projector stopped working halfway through the talk. But maybe that wasn't what she needed from him. It hit her that it hit her then what was so special about Adam, that no matter his reputation or how rocky their first meeting since the very beginning olive had felt that he was on her side over and over in and in ways that she could never have anticipated he had made her feel unjudged less alone she exhaled slowly the realization should have been rattling but it had an oddly calming effect yes she told him thinking that this might very well turn out to be all right. She might never have what she wanted from Adam, but for now at least, he was in her life. That was going to have to be good and enough. I will then. She leaned forward. Will you ask a long-winded, leading question that will cause me to ramble incoherently and lose the respect of my peers thus forever undermining my place in the field of biology. Possibly. He was smiling. Should I buy you that disgusting... Adam gestured toward the register pumpkin, pumpkin sludge now. She grinned. Oh yes, I'm in, if you want to. I'd rather buy you anything else. Too bad. Olive jumped to her feet and headed for the counter, tugging at his sleeve for, for and forcing him to stand with her. Adam followed, meekly mumbling something about black coffee that Olive chose to ignore. Enough, she repeated to herself. What do you have now? It will have to be.